Hello and welcome back. Today we are going to be continuing our Victoria 3 tutorial series and we are going to be doing the third flagship tutorial for the Economics Post 1.5. Uh, for this tutorial we are going to be talking about mid-game industrialization. In the early game you care about de-peasanting as quickly as possible. Once you run out of peasants then you sort of transition to a mid-game industrialization period. In the early game you care about efficiency per construction. In the mid-game you are going to start caring about efficiency per pop and that is going to be the main idea we are exploring today, although I think it's important to note that there is a secondary mid-game transition we will be making a separate video on, which is where you start to not care about ownership as much. Um, at this current point in time, we're going to assume we still care about capitalist ownership. So in this video, we are going to be discussing, um, and please, if you have any children, please ask them to leave the room. I'll give you a moment. Okay, we are going to be primarily using the spreadsheet uh, here to, uh, uh, you know, explain our thinking as well as evaluating different buildings. And we are going to be comparing largely this pink, uh, purple column, which is newly updated, which is talking about efficiency per 100 workers and comparing it to the early game sort of focused column, which is efficiency per week of construction. Because once you've run out of peasants, uh, you can't really do the same sort of uh, uh, focus in terms of what you're looking at. And so we're going to be talking about this, but we're also going to be talking about kind of an uh, important uh, paradigm shift in terms of how you are thinking about the game in that I think it's important or critical that we stop uh, thinking about buildings as being singular entities like this is three buildings buildings and instead evaluate buildings on the basis of how much construction they cost and also uh, on the basis of how much labor they're using uh, because this is going to be a much more useful abstraction than focusing on the number of buildings. Uh, we will also be discussing, uh, you know, a few examples and talking about how this period is really a transitionary period. It's not like a light switch where you go from suddenly caring about uh, only construction efficiency per construction uh, to now caring only about efficiency per population. Uh, generally, you will have different areas of your economy in different phases at one time or different states in your economy. And so it's important to understand why building something in one place can be good and building it in another place can be bad. Um, because you will have different considerations as your economy is uh, transitioning. And so we will give kind of a theoretical example of that, uh, you know, to kind of explain our ideas. And without further ado, let's get into it. Just kidding, there will be a little bit more ado because I just wanted to point out and emphasize that this mid-game transition is based on what your employment profile looks like and not kind of anchored to technology and different countries will experience a, a middle game or this sort of mid game caring about efficiency per pop at different points in the game. And so we're not basing the heuristic off of, uh, you know, the amount of tech you achieve, even though this is the kind of the most intuitive way of looking at it. And instead you're gonna have it at different points for different countries. It will be really late with Qing and it will be really early for some country uh, like Belgium. So in one of our previous tutorials, we really focused in on the subsistence farms um, as something that was a little bit of an aberration relative to other buildings. And I think it's worth repeating or emphasizing um, that they get paid in something called subsistence output, which is money that is coming from nothing. They're the crypto bros of pops. And what they buy with this, what they buy with this is fake goods. Uh, the buy orders that are created by peasants, they only create 10% of the buy orders in the market. Um, and as such, they do not increase the price of market goods. Uh, we remember that as prices come up, um, this increases or gives you more opportunity to build profitable buildings. And so overall, this will have a depressing effect on the economy, but also their output is really low. And the whole reason their SOL can stay high is a combination of the fact that they are getting, uh, you know, kind of this free nothing of uh, this free money from nothing, which is in kind um, uh, sort of payment. And so um, this was a lot, was what allows them to not have this absolutely tanky SOL. But if we take a look inside, um, you know, the spreadsheet and we look at uh, kind of this new column we are focusing on, which is efficiency per hundred worker, it will help to kind of emphasize size or drive home the point of why you know building a sawmill which has an efficiency per hundred worker of 21 
and an efficiency per week of construction of 100. Why this is so good, because what we are doing is we are bringing pops off of the subsistence farms, which have an efficiency uh, per 100 workers of 2.7. So this means every time we build uh, a lumber mill, for example, uh, we will be getting the marginal difference between these two, which is roughly uh, 19 value uh, per 100 workers. And it is important to note the construction cost in the early game, what we are caring about is the construction cost uh, is only 200. Uh, and so we are getting 19 per 200 construction, roughly speaking, we are getting 100 efficiency per week of construction. Now, compared to something like uh, steel, which kind of uh, a, a, a reasonable one where we might have at the same time is this Bessemer process tools. Um, comparing to something like this, we take a look, it has 800 construction. So we can de-peasant uh, 20,000 pops, roughly speaking, in the same time it uh, by building lumber mills, uh, in the same time it takes to de-peasant 5,000 pops by building steel mills because it has four times the construction cost. And so while we are focusing on de-peasanting, we get a lot of value. If we take a look here, this is 26. This is the uh, efficiency per 100 workers. And to be fair, this is more than the sawmills. Uh, but instead what we have though is we can repeat this process of gaining 19 value by you know switching peasants to sawmills we can repeat this process of switching these guys who have 2.7 value per 100 workers four times in the same amount of time period and this is why early game you definitely want to be building sawmills over steel however when you have no more peasants the jig is up you don't get to uh just extract as much value as possible by turning these peasants into uh you know stuff for sawmills and instead um what you can do is you can start to recomp your economy now, before we talk about recomping the economy, I just wanted to emphasize that you want to be in deep peasant mode as long as possible. You want to have a lot of peasants. Uh, you want to go out of your way to increase your population and have access to this because your construction is way more efficient while you have peasants. Uh, and uh, I can't emphasize this enough. This is why China uh, always has a really, really high velocity come up because they can stay in the early game phase as long as possible. You're not trying to transition from one phase to the other. Recomping your economy should should be seen as a necessary concession uh, to the fact that you have run out of the resource of having peasants and it is always preferable uh, to have to, uh, to be oriented or nearly always preferable to be oriented towards uh, not efficiency per worker but efficiency per construction. The problem is of course when you run out of workers you suddenly have to care about the workers. When we are talking about recomping the economy we are talking about uh, taking stuff that already has decent efficiency, stuff that has been deep has and instead of building a new building allowing the workers to work in something that is a little bit more efficient and so we could think about hey we have these sawmills here um, we would want to maybe increase and go to steel tools because we see even though steel tools way worse in terms of per construction for deep peasanting it's way worse than wood um, it is more efficient per worker uh, just here with the base PM and so we could instead of spending 200 construction uh, like we did with the sawmills uh, here, 200 construction in order to get 19 of value from changing them from working on the subsistence farm to working in the sawmills. Instead, we could pay 600 construction to get 14 of value. And so it's a much worse rate by switching them from being in the sawmills uh, to instead of being in on the steel tools. Now, when you do this, the logging camps that you had built will still be useful in a sense because they will be effectively operating as if they were kind of the new subsistence farms uh, that you would have had because your pops when they migrate and when they you know grow uh, can get employed up in the logging camps and also uh, you will have the positive benefit of the loud car outside which includes of course this extra available employment modifier which will help to facilitate migration and in terms of the louder motorcycle um, this will give you uh, more uh, migration attraction per construction uh, than a lot of other things you can focus on and while you're not really wanting to build for migration attraction this is a little bit of consideration and why you know it is worth it to really go after eliminating all of the peasants uh, even though you know you're going to transition and start building other stuff or emphasizing other stuff um, in just a little bit once you finish de-peasanting. 
Now, this brings us to labor-saving PMs or automation, um, which have a bunch of interesting relationships, and these become very important as you are running out of pops, as you are entering a sort of new phase in the game. If you take a look here, you can see the efficiency per 100 workers when we're on sawmills will go up about 1 point or 1.1 points when we add steam donkeys, uh, because it is going to be using less labor here. Uh, we go from using 4,600 workers to 3,600, um, and so in this way, we can recomp our economy, effectively speaking, uh, by adding labor-saving PMs um, uh, more aggressively. But there's a few things to notice here. This will make the building less efficient per construction. It will change the net value added from the building and also make it lower, uh, which means that the building itself, if we are thinking of buildings as the individual units, kind of looks worse. And so um, in order to properly appreciate why labor-saving PMs are good, we need to kind of get beyond thinking of a building as just an individual unit. And instead, we just think of it as a kind of a holder for a combination of construction, which is one of our resources, and a holder for pops which are employed in it. Uh, this is definitely an improvement, uh, and this uh, should not be spooky, the fact that we are decreasing the net value added, but it is important to note when we do this, we will decrease the price flexibility. And what this column denotes is how much you can change the price of the input goods uh, without de uh, and the output goods in an unfavorable way and still have the building be profitable or employ up. When we have a net value added of 1K and we have input Outputs of 200 and outputs of 600, we could decrease the outputs by 50% here. We could decrease them to, you know, 600 and increase the inputs uh, by 50% to 300, and we would still have a positive net value added. If we do that once we're on the labor saving PM, we'll kind of just treat this as 600. If we do this uh, and then this, there's no value anymore. The building will not be able to employ up a single person. And so it is important to note that this does increase, decrease the price flexibility as you do this, but overall, it is gonna be a positive thing when what you are caring about is starting to be efficiency per 100 workers. Another thing that's very important to emphasize is when we turn this on, now we have a thousand more pops. So now we have rolled back the situation towards an early game economy for just a little bit longer where those thousand pops, if they get employed in a subsistence farm, can now transition to being in a logging camp, uh, a sawmill. And so it is m even more attractive than it appears at first blush, okay? So back to the point about changing the way we think about buildings, uh, because I think this is important because this makes it look unattractive if we're just looking at the net. And instead of thinking this as three logging camps, I think the way to properly think of it as it's an investment of 600 construction that employs 6.7K workers. It's 600 construction that employs 6.7K workers. I think this is important because as we turn on the labor-saving PMs, except chainsaws, which sucks, and we never turn that on ever, as we turn on the labor-saving PMs, we are effectively increasing the cost of the building. We are making it cost more construction. Now, very often I say construction falls off, and I probably should stop saying that because it's not the case that, well, construction does fall off, but what it instead does is you, it changes in its value because what it allows you to do is it allows you to both recomp and turn on more labor saving PMs because it's going to require more construction to employ the seven, the same 6.7k pops as we add labor saving PMs. And so what the construction instead is dedicated towards is furthering this automation ability while maintaining a state of having no peasants in your state. Now, if we come back into the spreadsheet, uh, we will see kind of another column that we have newly added to the spreadsheet, which is construction cost per 1000 uh, units of labor. And if we take a look here, you can see if we highlight the sawmills, we see that, you know, kind of base, it costs uh, around 43 construction per Per 100 uh, per 1k labor if we switch over to something like industrial goods like steel you will see it costs 4x because it's roughly 4x the price and uh you know on the 4600 pm they use the same uh, but when we take a look at you know the sawmills as we add labor saving pms we are increasing the price per construction or or the construction cost per 1000 workers and i think it's important to think about or to reframe buildings as not being individual buildings but instead 
instead being construction investments uh, that uh, employ a certain amount of labor. And so when you are in the early game, you care about this a lot. And you want this to be really low because de-peasanting pops is really valuable beyond kind of the normal value that you're adding uh, from adding a more efficient building. You're also increasing uh, consumption because you're actually producing pops that don't, they aren't crypto bros that have fake money and buy fake goods. Um, but when you start running out of labor, you do not care about this really very much at all. Um, and so you start wanting to go more towards, it's not like you specifically are pursuing um, having high uh, construction costs per 1000 labor, like some buildings just aren't going to be very attractive and some are gonna be attractive no matter what, like mines in general are really attractive. Um, but this becomes less of a factor uh, that you will value. But I think that this is important uh, for reframing the building and to not think of the building as, hey, that's three logging camps, but instead that is uh, you know 600 units of construction that employs 6.7k pops. Now, this is a bit more of an advanced idea, but I think it's worth bringing up because it's highly relevant to the uh, conversation. We did a solution, uh, a game theory solution for uh, prices and what they should be to make you indifferent as to what building you construct. Um, so if we take a look, uh, you know, kind of back at uh, the efficiency per construction, uh, and we take a look at it on sawmills, if we decrease the output value, we'll see that the efficiency per construction goes way down. And so while you care about efficiency per construction, there's a theoretical price level where every good is at a specific price that makes this exact efficiency per construction exactly the same for every building. And so what this would require is, for example, wood to be cheap and something, you know, like steel, the classic, uh, you know, opposite of wood example having this be very expensive because it's only got an output of 30 per construction and so what we did is we solved or we kind of got close to the solution we did a little bit of guess and check um, so that our net equilibrium efficiency our equilibrium efficiency per construction on this example of these is all roughly the same it's all kind of roughly around 57 58 efficiency per construction at these different price levels for this theoretical economy in which where we have, uh, you know, iron, wood, coal, tools, and steel, and that's it. And what we got per week of construction was these prices for these goods here. You'll notice wood is extremely cheap when what you care about is construction and making you indifferent to what you build on a per construction basis. Uh, something like steel is extremely expensive um, and we did have to assume specific PMs. These are the PMs, blister steel, not that good a PM as well on top of uh, you know soft wood on um, the sawmills being very good PM. But we see that there are different price values where we would not care which we built um, because no matter what, we will get the exact same output per construction. You'll notice we did the exact same thing when we cared about per 100 workers. And you see here the equilibrium efficiency on all these is roughly the same with different input prices. And you'll notice a very, very sharp uh, change on the stuff that costs 200 construction and to a lesser extent, the stuff that costs 800 and then 600 construction. The 400 construction cost stuff was kind of the, more the control and that stayed roughly the same. And you'll notice the price of softwood went from being minus 33% to plus 25%. This is why when you run out of pops, uh, as you start going getting into the mid game, your lumber camps won't employ up all the way because the equilibrium price you're going to be trending towards on them is going to be higher. Now, this is a theoretical economy we're not accounting for labor saving PMs um, and it's uh, using these PMs and this sort of stuff. And so it's not meant to be like, this is not uh, the prices I'm suggesting you try and get the goods towards, but this does kind of uh, show the point that what we talk about when we talk about emphasizing a building is we are willing to tolerate a lower price on it and still want to build it. That's what it means to focus on something. And when I say you don't want to focus on something, which to be fair, you never really want to focus on steel, um, I'm saying that you would tolerate a higher price before you want to build more of the building. And so I think this is worth noting. And finally, we have a third example while we are using
using labor-saving PMs, we are using water tube boiler on the steel tools and water tube on blister, stool, uh, blister steel, and we are caring about the efficiency per 100 worker. Notably, water tube on steel tools is a little bit more efficient, and we see that this will further bring down the price equilibrium uh, for both the ones that are employing the PM when what you care about is the labor saving. And I know this is maybe a lot to take in, and equilibriums is more of an advanced concept, but I do think it's uh, kind of useful uh, for driving home the point that, you know, we are going to care about different things, and this is going to dramatically change what our economy looks like, and even which buildings are going to actually be able to employ up, um, you know, at certain levels, and you will see the logging camps fail to employ, even though the building is insane. The reason being is the building is insane because it is ridiculously cheap. Uh, it only costs 200 construction. Similarly, another very similar example is going to be, you know, the rice farms, which are obscene because they have only 200 construction. They should really be 400 construction. They employ uh, 10K laborers, but their efficiency per, you know, 100 workers is not going to be, uh, it's going to be very, very similar. If we take a look at them on threshing machines, it's going to be 28. And we take a look at camp, uh, weed farms, it's going to be 28. But their efficiency per week of construction is obscenely different where it's going to be Kempfert's, it's going to be 240 versus 120. And so this is kind of, I think, uh, maybe something that will be useful, even if it is a, a little bit abstract or advanced, uh, taking a look at these equilibriums here. Now, to save on time, I don't want to focus too much on the individual PMs, but I thought it would broad strokes go through the different types of industries and how they kind of differ in efficiency per worker relative to efficiency per construction. Uh, generally speaking, the resource industries, with the exception of the wood, uh, tends to be extraordinarily strong, still efficiency per 100 worker. I think the very best is the sulfur mines. You have to ignore the dynamite because it's calculating the marginal uh, 250 pops. They do increase the amount of pops needed, uh, but... The, uh, it's absolutely obscene before you even take into consideration that um, and the, the PMs are just very strong in the resources on the agriculture and this is a bit of an interesting one agriculture is efficient per week of construction but early on you don't want the aristocratic ownership and then later on when you are starting to care about efficiency per 100 worker they're really not that efficient and so um, this is uh, an interesting one with the very best performing one being opium at 52 efficiency per worker and then cotton plantations is better than it looks because it you do get additional through put with the cotton gin tech. Uh, the industrial ones uh, tend to look a lot better when you start thinking of efficiency per 100 construction, and this makes a lot of sense because this is where the 600 and 800 cost buildings are. When you stop caring as much about the cost of building and you start caring about how much labor it's employing, obviously these ones improve a lot, and this is kind of the story where, uh, you know, machine steel, uh, the rubber tools on uh, kind of the latest PM that you will probably end up wanting to use because assembly line consumes oil is 80, which is very very robust. There's really high variance though. A lot of these industries still suck, uh, like for example steel mills, which is the classic comparison between that and rubber. Uh, even on kind of the very latest things will only boast a 46, which is still worse than wood per 100 workers, uh, when wood has the very best it can offer. Um, uh, motor Industries is an aberration because um, this actually adds 1,500 workers. Uh, this is a case with a lot of these other PMs that add workers, and it makes them not as good as they would otherwise look. If you're just looking at net value added, this extra 1,500 workers with only adding 100 net value, if you use electric engines, because you don't want to use deal silk because the oil, use autos, and you use rotary valve engine, you actually end up with having a negative net. Uh, your net is uh, pretty negative, and I, it almost makes me think that I put this in wrong but the pm really sucks um and it sucks because it adds 1500 workers and you can't afford your margin's not good enough to turn on labor saving pms and even though your automobile industries uh, electric engine motor industries might be making money it's only making money because the the automobiles have to be absurdly expensive for this to play out um, but generally speaking, these will these will do a lot better, uh, but a lot of them are still not very good. Uh, the ones to really take away are the arms industries, the artillery industries, the shipyards, and the tools are going to be the ones that look really good. But keeping in mind, they all start to perform better. And the consumer goods uh, tend to look uh, a, a lot better as well. Um, not arts academies. We don't, we don't talk about those. Uh, but textile mills and furniture is an interesting one because you actually get precision tools and all the PMs for furniture pretty early. And so... 
you know, if you're on rotary valve engine, uh, it, you do have 32. Uh, again, this down here is calculating kind of the marginal difference on this extra 500 or extra 1K workers. And also interesting to note, more efficient per worker are the luxury furniture production and uh, craftsman sewing. I think you always go precision tools uh, because hardwood is, there's always a super shortage of it, but it might be the case that you just don't go elastics. Um, and then, uh, you know, power plants and railways are absolutely abysmal and groceries are very interestingly uh, going to be adding a lot of additional workers in a lot of spots where you see that they actually go up in workers and so they actually look awful per 100 worker it's decent for de-peasanting but it's really going to be quite bad and that's kind of just a quick rundown of some of these without focusing uh too too much on any individual one now a couple big influences on strategy are going to be the available resources and of course we can't forget local prices are going to affect things because even if we want to start building uh you know tools where we don't have uh, much labor uh, or would prefer to just uh spam like iron mines and wood everywhere uh it, it's still inefficient to eat the mapping penalty and there's not really a good way to mathematically model this kind of using our spreadsheet but i think we can talk through an example and i think russia provides a really good um uh, opportunity for that because they have this interesting company that is very strong new russia company limited uh and what this requires what this requires is we have uh luhansk has to have uh level 10 on their steel mills and have bessemer process in luhansk which means in order for them to do this in luhansk which has you know 2.5 million pops in order for them to do this here, they're probably going to, for mappy reasons, going to want to have a lot of iron mines and coal mines as well in order to maybe be able to push steel up to level 10, right? And if they start doing this, then they are going to run out of labor here earlier than anyone else. And they want to do, or earlier than anywhere else, they want to do this because, man oh man, this company is good, right? Uh, and so it's, it's a really good company. And so you're in this situation where you are going to specifically be entering the mid game here in Russia and you're not going to be entering the mid game in other places. And so what you're going to end up doing here is you're going to have the tools, you're going to have all these sorts of things, all these toys, and you're going to be using the labor saving PMs here. And you're going to have opportunities for really profitable buildings because the buy order is created by the steel, um, you know, uh, and all the, the synergy and the looping of the things. Uh, the tools will be, uh, you will use the steel to increase the price of steel, giving it more profitability. Uh, the tools will be used to get the coal and the iron. Um, and so it'll increase the profitability of these by decreasing the price of the inputs and also the steel will be increasing the price of the outputs of the iron and the coal as a result of local prices and also be feeding into um uh, or sorry and then uh they will also these in turn will be making the steel cheaper and so you'll have this nice big loop but you will have no labor here in luhansk you will run out very quickly and so the first thing is you probably don't want to build logging camps in luhansk which is a little bit of an interesting one and instead you want to focus on this core loop and you are going to see this in a lot of your games where you are focusing on this core loop of buildings um, of tooling uh, iron coal and steel and then maybe logging building logging in these specific places is a little bit less important although it is very strong early because you know you're going to run out of labor here first another big one which we currently cannot build that will be a part of this is also going to be the explosives factory especially if you have sulfur um, because if you have sulfur and iron in one particular place building the explosives factories uh, and fertilizer plants there is going to be very good, but that's more of a mappy consideration. So we have this area in Luhansk. We know we're going to run out of labor there first, um, and so this is going to be our strategy where we are going to be turning on the labor saving PMs. Now, to be fair, once we hit the steel level 10 and we kind of exhaust our opportunities for profitable buildings, maybe we end up having tools up like to level 12 in this situation, 13. We kind of stop building here, but we're run out of labor. We turn on the labor saving PMs. We are also maybe going to want to do something similar in Perm, because Perm has obscene bonuses in that they have the Iron Mines building throughput bonus. And so we're going to want to build a bunch of Iron Mines here in Perm, and also in Ural, and maybe to some extent uh, the logging industry, although you see this Russia taiga is all over the place. And so we are planning ahead for this uh, entering the middle game earlier uh, in these specific provinces. And often where you build first and you build all this construction loop first, um, you will enter middle game faster on these. What we do on everything else, um, we know that wood is still disgustingly efficient, 
per construction. And so what we can do is we can come into the settings here, we select logging camps and we select peasants. And what we can do is we can, every place that has available peasants, we can just add logging camps we can take care and be a little bit more uh, precise and maybe not do it where we're expecting to run out of labor, but we put them all over the place where we have a lot of peasants and we maybe add a few extra in places that have less. Just to be clear, this is after we actually ramp up construction, this example we're talking about. And then we put them on auto expand, all of these uh, you know, low level lumber bills. And so we will kind of be able to, uh, they will only expand if they're fully employed. So once they stop ha start having labor problems, they'll stop doing that. I can't resist swapping that. And so we will have this uh, kind of situation where we are going to be, you know, we have these industrial zones uh, where we are building our construction because we will definitely have all of our construction sectors in Luhansk at least initially um, or other areas similar to this we probably not all in Luhansk because uh, considerations regarding infrastructure um, but we will have these industrial sectors which are going to have iron coal tools and this sort of stuff and then in the rural areas where you know we don't have very good resources uh you know in terms of having both coal and iron it's still worthwhile to build wood there because it's so efficient and so we can have this hybrid economy um, where we are going to be more uh you know pop efficiency oriented in the specific place where we are building our construction sectors the iron mines the coal mines the tools and then we are looking to double dip or not double dip, but we are looking to dip into construction efficiency uh, and de-peasanting pops in rural areas with, uh, you know, the uh, the logging specifically. And logging and resources are really good for this. To some lesser extent, you can also do it with fish, uh, but logging and resources are really good with this. And one of the reasons for this is if we jump back into the spreadsheet and take a look, they have really high price flexibility. Which means uh, that if we take a look at the resources and we scroll up to logging, um, we have price flexibility of 600%. Um, that's, uh, you know, the output divided by the input is six, right? Uh, and so what can happen is even if we're really negatively affected by MAPI, we can really tolerate, uh, you know, kind of a negative price effect. Uh, you know, we can bring down the price by one sixth and we will still have very strong efficiency per week of construction, even on the and we will have the same phenomenon with the iron and so what we will end up doing is we will be overbuilding the wood um, we will be perhaps because we're still in the early game underbuilding um, you know stuff like the tools and the steel a little bit but looking to do it in such a way uh, looking to do it in such a way so as to be efficient per worker uh, and still you know achieve our aims of being able to put in new Russia limited company um, and then we will be able to um, we with the one moment please so we will be able to focus uh, on being efficient per worker and then also in a sense we will be supplying these tools uh, you know to the logging camps because the logging camps and the mines are all over the place right we will be supplying them from kind of centralized places that care more about efficiency per hundred worker eating a little bit of a mappy penalty to do so um, but it kind of uh, coincides with our aims a little bit to some extent you know in this case of Russia. Another good example of how you can be in mixed situations in regards to your economy is even as you enter the late game, you can still have spots that are in early game. In this Brazil run, in Minas Gerais, we are definitely running out of pops. You know, it says that guys are unemployed, but we have a ton of available employment in the building. It's just kind of frictional. And we do have the logging camps that can't employ uh, because they're not efficient enough per worker relative to, you know, some of the other stuff that can employ up. And we're even using assembly lines here. Jeez. Um, but at the same time, we just annexed Persia somewhat recently here. And so we will see, if we take a look, uh, a ton of available peasants in these areas. Now, on top of this, we also have, we should have some turmoil somewhere. Do we really not have turmoil? Okay, we have turmoil here. We will be having a state construction efficiency malice. But the construction de-peasanting the pops is so disgustingly efficient that at this point, considering that, you know, we're not going to be a very efficient per construction in Minas Gerais anyways, we can just build up here and eat this construction malice and de-peasant these pops. There are so many pops that are, you know, peasants, we even have unemployed, that what we would want to start doing here is we would want to start pushing the resources very aggressively. And what we can even do here 
is we can be pretty aggressive about swapping off of the labor saving PMs that are essential in kind of our other area of the economy in uh, Minas Gerais. If we don't have these labor saving PMs on, these places will not employ and they'll just go work in the clothing factory instead, which can, you know, hire workers. And so um, this is necessary for like any level of employment. But if we take it over here, uh, we can deep peasant more pops if we don't use these labor saving PMs. And it, to be fair, it's easier to micro if we just turn them on and that's all fair and good. But I think it's a good example of how you can be thinking through your various states on a per state basis. Um, you know, what type of economy does this state look like? And if we're sorting by peasants, you know, um, we can say that these peasanted areas, these heavy peasant areas, are going to be really good opportunities to build profitable buildings when we care about on a per construction basis. So when we're looking at buildings with a ton of peasants, we can take a look back in the spreadsheet, you know, and we can take a look and instead we will be looking at this column, efficiency per week of construction, because we can really pop off by de-peasanting these pops. And then, you know, when we go over to Minas Gerais, where we are out of labor completely, we think of things in terms of efficiency per 100 workers. And so we have this bifurcated economy because we just acquired new territory that has a ton of additional workers. And so if you are in this sort of, we really care about the labor saving PMs, we're scraping the bottom of the barrel running even assembly line, which is traditionally not one you want to run. If this is the case, eating a construction malice with newly conquered territory, definitely going to be worth it. Uh, you know, that way we can have the play pattern of taking this agricultural, uh, you know, the taking them from these things things uh these subsistence farms over in the case of our brazil game which is fairly late game uh you know two uh electric sawmills or in this case electric sawmills focusing on uh efficiency per week of construction rather than per laborer So to summarize, in the early game, you are focused on efficiency per week of construction. And what the mid-game transition is about, mid-game industrialization, is a transition from caring about efficiency per week of construction to caring about efficiency per 100 workers. In the early game, when you're caring about efficiency per week of construction, the play pattern that you really, really emphasize is you are switching stuff from being subsistence farm uh, oriented, which only has 2.7 you know, output per worker, uh, to instead being uh, uh, more efficient on something like sawmills, which have 21.7 output per 100 workers, which is a gain of nine, uh, 19 per 100 worker. In this instance, you really care about the construction because we can do this four times in the same amount of time it would take to take one of these subsistence rice farms and instead, you know, build it into a steel mill, which has 800 construction. And so even though it's more efficient per worker in the early game, you don't want to do the steel mills uh, uh, you don't want to emphasize the steel mills because you can you can add like 24 worth of value in your economy switching one singular uh, subsistence farm to one singular uh, you know steel mill or you could do instead four sawmills and so what you will end up getting without going too much in de uh, detail regarding like price equilibriums which is something we did discuss what you will end up seeing is when you're focused on the early game you build a lot of wood and you focus on it and by focus on it you tolerate a much lower price um, we did do some calculations for price equilibrium and this is not necessarily a target but it would not be unreasonable when you are being uh, construction focused to see a wood price of minus 33 percent um, and you would at minus 25% the best thing to build might be wood just because it's so efficient per construction. When you run out of labor, now you start to care about your efficiency per 100 worker and you want to recomp your economy under such an environment, it's not unreasonable to see something like plus 25% price, uh, you know, on the softwood in this theoretical economy that doesn't exist there. Uh, and so you will start caring about this value, which is efficiency per 100 worker. And so this will generally favor uh, industries that are going to be, uh, you know, 600 and 800 construction cost and will generally disfavor uh, industries that are going to be around uh, 200 construction cost. We also discussed um, a way of kind of reframing buildings uh, in the sense that uh, we don't really want to think of buildings as singular entities anymore. And I think it's useful uh, to instead think of the buildings as um, you, their investments of construction that employ 
X number of pops, uh, specifically for thinking of labor, because um, when we turn on labor saving PMs, uh, this always costs more goods and it makes the individual building have less net. However, we are not thinking of things in terms of buildings. We want to think of the things in terms of how much construction they cost and how many pops they employ. So coming back in, um, we could take a look at a brief example here where the sawmills, for example, when we turn on Steam Donkey, our net uh, output is actually going to decrease. But what we are doing um, is it's going to instead employ way less pops. What we are doing is we are effectively increasing the cost of the building per 1000 labor. Uh, and so as you add labor saving PMs, which are going to be good and especially good because they give you more and a longer opportunity to de-peasant, which is very powerful uh, because you get a lot of velocity on de-peasanting because those 4,600 workers now being 3,600, now there's 1K unemployed. And so this is going to be good as we move kind of down uh, towards uh, later and later things. And we will see a commensurate rise in the efficiency per 100 worker, which is what we're focused on. We did kind of take a look at a couple examples in Brazil and Russia when talking about mixed uh, sorts of economies, wherein we discussed how you might want to build tall in Luhansk in order to gain access to one of their companies. And in such a situation, you would have a mid-game economy where you're labor focused in Luhansk, while in the outer areas of Russia, still be focusing on wood and you're focusing on something like iron tool uh, iron coal tools and steel in Luhansk and so this was uh, an example we used we also talked a little bit about Brazil uh, but we're not going to touch on that and I hope you guys enjoyed if you did please feel free to like comment subscribe do the YouTube algorithm thing and have a good day